Hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me well. I am Paul Cartledge. I sit on the development committee of the Classics for All educational charity. Thanks to all at Classics for All for setting this up, and especially to uh, Alice, to Alice Parr and her team for making this all possible. Classics for All is now well over 10 years old, got going in 2010. And in fact, I've just received the 2010 to 2021 impact report, courtesy of its sadly outgoing executive director, Jules Mann. A big shout out to you, Jules, and a big thanks. Without you, none of this, none of what has been achieved would have been possible. Thank you so much. I've also received the spring 2022 newsletter. And in that, our chair, the redoubtable Jimmy Mulville, reflects on a happily record breaking year. So this event comes at a particularly auspicious time in the history of classics for all next set of thanks goes of course to our principal speaker today daisy dunn dr daisy dunn thank you daisy for first of all writing and publishing the book which we'll be talking about uh, later and thank you for agreeing to appear in this question and answer session. Just to let you know how this um, event will pan out, I'll start off with um, a little introduction to Daisy, then she will say a little bit about how she came to write the book. Then we'll go straight into about half an hour of question and answer. And of course, the questions will come, they will hit Daisy like a brick, because of course, she will have absolutely no idea that they were coming. And then we'll throw that open, throw the discussion open if there are questions from the floor, as it were. And in this case, the floor, because we're on a Zoom by remote, questions should come in the chat box, please, which um, you'll see at the foot of your screen and either i or someone else will um, pick up as we're going through probably me um, what questions if any are to be added on to the ones that i shall be asking daisy so it's a very very great pleasure oh i should just add that after daisy and i are finished then i shall be handing over to hillary that is hillary hodgson who is jules Mann's successor as executive director of classics for all so that's an absolutely wonderful um coincidence and a terrific um uh, state of play for for our organization so without further ado daisy i'm basically going to read out what is on the dust jacket of this rather beautifully produced book not far from brideshead so Daisy is an award-winning classicist and biographer, born in London, and in fact she lives in London now, in Wimbledon, southwest 19. She read classics at Oxford, that is through St Hilda's College, before gaining a scholarship to the Courtauld Institute of Art, where she read an MA in um, the history of the art of the Italian Renaissance, and then to complete her hat trick, as it were, she went on to complete a doctorate at uh, UCL in classics and the history of art. She writes for a number of magazines and uh, newspapers. She is, in fact, unlike myself, who is uh, an academic, she is uh, a writer more broadly, a broadcaster. And among other outlets, she writes for the oldie, though she is by no means an oldie, as you will quickly uh, discern herself. 
She is, and this is very dear to my heart, the editor of the outreach magazine of the Hellenic Society, of which I am the current pres president. And the magazine is called Argo. And I do recommend as many as possible of you either to join the Hellenic Society or somehow get access to Argo. Her first books, Catullus's Bedspread, the life of Rome's most erotic poet, and the poems of Catullus, a new translation, were published on both sides of the Atlantic in 2016. Her dual biography followed of the two Plinies, the elder and the younger, and this was entitled In the Shadow of Vesuvius. A life of Pliny, mainly one, but also the other, if you see what I mean. And that was an editor's choice in the New York Times in 2019. So, Daisy, if I may hand you over to you now to, as it were, set the scene. And then once you've had your say, I shall start asking you a number of questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening. I thought by way of introduction, I would start to read from the first page of the first chapter of my book, just to sort of help set the scene of Oxford during the First World War. At a quarter past seven on an autumn morning, a young American rose and made his way through Merton College, Oxford, to sign his name at roll call. The staircase near his rooms on St Albans Quad led down to a small lawn that overlooked the fellow's garden. Skirting the grass, the young man shuffled across the flagstones, waved his hand wearily over the blank sheet and waited an interminable 40 minutes for breakfast. T.S. Eliot could not have imagined how depleted the university would be when he arrived from Harvard in October 1914. The long tables of the dining hall were ordinarily laid for hundreds of men, but with only 40 or so students remaining at the college in wartime, they looked ludicrously outsized. Apart from the emptiness, a strange sense of disorder prevailed over the space as the rhythms that had been perfected over the years fell slowly out of time. Visitors to the city in the 19th and early 20th centuries were often told that it produced nothing but parsons and sausages. Outside the university and its chapels, beyond the libraries with their miles of gently framed books and the fan vaulted splendor of Divinity School, almost a quarter of the county's population worked in agriculture. On market days, Farmers would drive their livestock into giant pens on Gloucester Green to be met by crowds of potential buyers leaning over the rails. Towards the end of the Great War, meat was rationed in many of the colleges to High Table, where the Dons dined, and to Tuesday and Thursday evenings for everyone else, with an allowance of £11 per student per week. In 1914, there was still a hope, or a pretense, that life could continue as it had with the usual formalities and traditions in place. Eliot and his peers sat down to breakfasts of Oxford sausages, coarse cut marmalade from Frank Cooper, the high street greengrocer, and if the atheists were down early, a healthy smattering of theologians. Now, Oxford changed dramatically during the Great War. Uh, there was an influx of international students really for the first time. Uh, women started to come up in slightly greater numbers than they had uh, before the war as male students were away fighting. Uh, the classicist E.R. Dodds, who is one of the protagonists in my account, uh, described Oxford as a, as a shrunken skeleton of a university in this period. And it was only really after the war that things very, very slowly began to return to normal, by which time a lot of change had occurred and was irreversible. And in some ways, this was a good thing. Uh, in 1920, there was the introduction of degrees for women. 
And uh, I can taunt Paul uh, with this one by saying that Cambridge didn't introduce degrees for women until 1948. So uh, right. 20. <laughs> Oxford kind of setting the trend uh, there with that one. And um, so if many young people came up to Oxford after the, world, the First World War uh, with a sort of hope for a new lease of life, a new beginning. And this helps to give birth to the sort of roaring 20s that we see documented in the books of Evelyn Waugh and other, others. Uh, Evelyn Waugh came up to Hartford College in 1922. And by the mid 1920s, you have uh, Oxford Holmes, many of the what would be the leading poets of the early 20th century. So people like W.H. Auden, Louis McNeese, Stephen Spender. Um, sort of mentioned Elliot earlier, sort of a whole a group of people. And that begins to change towards the late 1920s and certainly by the early 30s, there's a feeling that something else is in the air, that there's a real change. I describe the period I, I sort of write about in this book as being a slither of light between two shadows. And certainly sort of by the end of the 1930s, very sadly, that premonition on the part of the students is proved to be true. Well, thank you so much. Um, are you carrying on there or would you like me to pitch in now? I'm happy for you to pitch in. <laughs> okay, so you're a classicist, Daisy, and um, your published works have typically, in terms of books, been about classical subjects in the sense of about classical figures, actually Roman rather than Greek. So what was it, apart from what you've already indicated, which gives us a pretty good, I think, suggestion, you're talking about great literary figures, but what was it that drew you to the interwar period as a classicist between the First and the Second World Wars? Um, well, I, I stumbled upon a story completely by accident. Uh, I went up to North Yorkshire in 2016 to speak at a literary festival. And while I was there, I thought I'll, I'll get, pop along to Castle Howard because I'd never been before. And probably like most people, I, I was familiar with it from the 1980s TV adaptation of Evelyn Waugh's Bright Had Revisited. So my knowledge of the place was sort of almost confined to that. So I was really surprised when I arrived and uh, sort of witnessed so much classical art sort of in, in the Great Hall itself. So everything from uh, the son of, of Helios sort of falling out of the sky in his chariot to all the busts of the Roman emperors. And some of them had sort of direct relevance to the place. Think of Septimius Severus, he died at York. So you kind of see some relevance there, but I, I hadn't expected such a vast collection. So I started sort of reading up on, on this and I was surprised that I, I hadn't realized that one of the leading classicists of the 20th century, Gilbert Murray, married into the family who lived at Castle Howard. I thought oh, that's interesting. I sort of, I'd read quite a lot of Gilbert Murray's work as a student. His name was certainly sort of on my reading lists. And I just became really interested in the story uh, about uh, sort of Gilbert Murray and uh, the, the sort of competition for his job at Oxford, uh, sort of the circle that he had with, with E.R. Dodds and with Morris Bower. And that was my starting point uh, to look at the periods uh, sort of more broadly. And I was aware that there's been a lot of Oxford books in the past. There've been a lot of books on the Inklings and Tolkien and uh, even War and his friends. And I kind of thought there might be a space for the voice of a classicist uh, to look at sort of what classics contributed to the conversation and sort of the culture uh, in that period. And, and I was struck by the fact that this, this sort of trio of figures that I, I zoned in on, uh, Gilbert Murray, Morris Bower, E.R. Dodds, were actually friends of a lot of these people in these other two groups, the sort of the even war group, um, also the Bloomsbury group, and uh, the sort of the Inklings as well. So they were kind of almost the, the invisible connections I, I kind of felt in a lot of the biographies I've been reading. So I kind of built my story from there. Well, I think that's a really excellent um, conception, a group biography, but it has actually, um, probably you were quite aware of this, but in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, one aspect of uh, our field is what's now called reception studies. And so what you've done is um, shine a light on one particular moment of reception. And so what I'd like to ask you next, and I do apologize, by the way, to any viewers 
um, if my screen, if I'm lagging, it's because my bandwidth is low. I do apologize for that. What I'd like, would you please situate classics as a discipline as broadly as you care to, um, not just at Oxford, in other words, because in a way, um, Oxford was, and in some people would say is, the premier center of classical studies in this part of the world. But could you say a little bit more about classics in the UK, perhaps, to begin with, more generally in the interwar years? Yeah, so, um... I mean, so going back to your point briefly on, on classical reception has always been sort of a field of interest to me. I sort of wrote my doctorate looking on at uh, classical literature and its reception in Italian Renaissance art. So I sort of studied the discipline. I was quite interested in it from that perspective. So I came to this book kind of armed with a lot of uh, the kind of machinery and the mechanics of, of that that I learned as a student and sort of applied it in a different way to this book. And uh, I, I kind of, I, I, I read, Greats myself uh, at Oxford, and I always had sort of great respect for the course, but I hadn't realised and sort of what high esteem it was held in the early part of the 20th century. And I came across something called the Student's Handbook, which is sort of an unofficial guide to life at the university, which was printed and reprinted numerous times. And this book has a description of Literae Humaniores, as it's known in full, as being uh, the premier school in dignity and importance and sort of making the sort of the greatest demands on, on, on students and also on the examiners, which seemed quite overblown uh, to me, but obviously it kind of reflected something of uh, the, the kudos associated with, with the subject and that particular course at that time. And that was reflected more broadly in the fact that students of other subjects, such as English, were required to pass something called responsions, which were these sort of preliminary examinations, which were kind of preludes to their actual chosen courses in which they had to sit examinations in maths and Latin and Greek, which is quite a tall order. Um, so certainly at the beginning part of the, of the book, the, book that, the period that I'm writing about, that was the case. So that in itself was, you know, a surprise for me. And sort of more broadly, looking outside of Oxford, uh, classics was, I think it was entering the public eye um, a lot more, partly through the popularity of plays. So Gilbert Murray uh, had translated uh, a sort of a, a whole collection of Euripides plays, and these started to find their place in the, in the sort of London theatres. And the broader public were sort of getting to know Medea and Oedipus and, you know, a, a whole variety of different characters. And this is kind of helped along by the fact that W.B. Yeats um, comes by these plays. And he has this intention of, of creating a sort of a new theatre group uh, for putting on plays which he saw as problematic. And he highlighted Euripides Hippolytus as being a problematic and difficult play. So he approached Gilbert Murray and said, oh, will you come on board and sort of join this sort of theatre company that I'm putting together? And Gilbert Murray was immediately put off by it. He didn't like the name of it. I think it was called something like the Theatre of Beauty initially. And he sort of turned mm. down the, this invitation, which is probably sort of a good thing uh, in the long run, because that actually folded while WB Yeats went on to found uh, the Abbey Theatre instead. But I think that helps to sort of bring uh, the classical world into the public consciousness uh, in, in, a, in a new way and certainly sort of as the decades progress you get more and more poets looking back to classical theatre and taking a broader interest in it. Well if I can be a little bit autobiographical like you I read great rather earlier a little way before you did but I had another point of interest in your book because my late father-in-law was one of those Oxford undergraduates who in 1930, was it two or 33, took part in that famous uh, Oxford Union debate about whether or not this house would um, die, as it were, for king and country, then king. And the vote was a pretty substantial majority for not doing so. And that caused a scandal. And my point here is that that's because Oxford then um, was quite a big deal politically in the country as a whole. Oxford had its own MP, and I should add my late father-in-law was one of the very first to volunteer in 1939 when actually he was asked whether he would um, sign up for king and country. But nevertheless, 
I think what's important and interesting about your book is it's not just an esoteric interest that you have in certain figures in Oxford classics, but that Oxford and within Oxford classics were quite a big deal in the 1920s and 1930s. So thank you very much for that. Now, um, we move on. You've already mentioned um, you select certain protagonists and in a way a triangle, you know, the eternal triangle. In this case, it's a mentor, a patron and two students. And then it's the um, relations between the three of them that are uh, your informing thread through the book. So <clears throat> could I just ask you to begin with to say um, something about each of those three? And shall we begin with Gilbert Murray? Do you know, dilate, do say more than you've already said, because we're going to come back to his theatre. But I'd like to hear a little bit more about his role um, as professor of Regis Professor of Greek, and secondly, within the League of Nations, if you could say something about that too, please. Okay, so um, Gilbert Murray was the sort of senior uh, of these figures. He grew up in Australia, which was unusual in itself um, for, for, for this period. He was one of the few first professors to come from the Dominions. And he came over as a child after the death of his father. And he was educated briefly in London and then went up to St John's College, Oxford to read classics. And he sort of did a, a brief fellowship uh, there and his first sort of proper job was at Glasgow. And in the interim, he met and fell in love with Lady Mary of Castle Howard. And I sort of dedicate a chapter to his rather sort of fraught attempt to woo her. It takes years. It, <laughs> it's quite sort of reading these letters. It's a very unusual setup where he is writing back and forth to her mother. And she's quite sort of staunchly opposed to the idea of getting married. Eventually, uh, he he wins her hand. And uh, I sort what of was it she had against uh, Murray as a prospective son-in-law? Was it that he was Australian, or was it that he was a classicist? Well, the, so the Countess of Carlisle, who ended up being his mother-in-law, she had quite lofty ideas for her children. She wanted her, one of the sons to come on and become the Messiah. And she wanted the girls to marry well. <laughs> and he wasn't from the wealthiest of families, but I think that wasn't her main objection to him. I think when he first began to woo her daughter, she was more keen on him than the daughter was. Uh, the daughter said she didn't want to become a Mrs. Carlyle to him. She wanted to have her own life. You know, she was a very headstrong, and I think that's that kind of adjective sort of slightly about um, but she was a sort of she was a woman who knew her own mind she knew what she wanted she wanted to be able to do her own sort of work she was a great linguist and she didn't want to have to sort of just be wife to him and she had that worry about him he didn't have a job initially I mean he kind of won this job at, at, at Glasgow as I said and that kind of helped to decide matters and then he went on uh, in 1908 to be elected as Regis Professor uh, of Greek at Oxford, which was extremely prestigious. And he he didn't think he was up to it initially. There are some really interesting letters he writes to his wife, Lady Mary, in which he says he doesn't think he's published widely enough. He doesn't think that his interests are focused enough. And he was succeeding uh, Ingram Bywater, who was a sort of a, a specialist in Aristotle, among others. Yeah. And he just didn't think he was up to it. And arguably he hadn't published a lot and it was a bit of a gamble to choose him, but that gamble paid off and he stayed in that post until, until 1936. And then the question came uh, as to who would succeed him in that role. And uh, so there were <laughs> a few sort of options uh, in, in uh, Oxford. Um, there was someone called John Deniston, uh, who was a sort of very, able classicist who sort of worked on the Oxford Classical Dictionary. And then there was Morris Bowron, who had studied under him uh, as a student. He was someone who saw service in the Great War. He was in the trenches. He didn't talk a lot about his war experience. Um, it was clearly very traumatic. Uh, and he was a very vibrant, character. Uh, he, he's sort of known for his witticisms. His friend Isaiah Berlin described him as one of the great wits uh, of the era. 
and say things like, you know, I'm having a long and interesting silence. And this is with someone who couldn't speak a word of English. Um, so he was very sort of sharp and uh, you know, very, very witty. And he kind of assumed that he would be getting the job, that he'd be becoming Regis Professor afterwards. Um, but there were- Have I just- can I just take you back to the First World War for two reasons. One, Murray becomes a founder of the League of Nations, which is desperately trying after yeah. Versailles, after the horrors of the First World War, to prevent that ever happening again. Of course, mm -hmm. in a sense it failed, though he saw some virtues, even though war broke out. But secondly, because the third of your trio, Dodds, has a very specific non-relationship, very hostile relationship to the First World War, unlike my father-in-law in the Second World War. Could you say a little about um, Eric Robertson Dodds's background and his attitude as an undergraduate and why that impacted on his career, not just then, but also we're gonna come up to the big bust up in 1936, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so it's really interesting hearing about your, your father-in-law and his position in that debate. I mean, that debate was defining. And I think we look at it in a completely different way today because we underestimate how pacifism was viewed. I think we've almost forgotten how pacifism was viewed in the First World War and between the First and the Second World War. So I'm leading back to Dodds from here, but from in this debate of 1933, the King and Country debate, as you said, the students of Oxford, the Oxford Union voted by a considerable majority that this house would in no circumstances fight for King and Country. And this sent, this created headlines um, across the world. Churchill sort of blamed the students for presenting Britain as being decadent and weak, um, you know, which is a, a strange attitude for us. Um, I think to understand uh, in this period, I don't think we'd, we'd view it like that at all. But this really you know, came home for, for E.R. Dodds. E.R. Dodds uh, was a young Irishman who came up to Oxford just before the First World War. And he was there during the war and he refused to fight. And he also, he, he kind of, um, he was a pacifist by nature. And he would talk over his position with Gilbert Murray, who was sympathetic. He was sympathetic towards students who were pacifistic at a time when it was dangerous to be so. And E.R. Dodds further, he decided to reveal um, his leanings in the Easter Rising and his support for that. And he was pretty much told not to come back again to Oxford. So he had to sort of take a year out. He was allowed to come back and sit his exams, but he wasn't allowed to sort of hit a final year of tuition as he would have expected. So that's the difference I think between now and then. It's kind of unimaginable, but it was a completely different attitude to pacifism in that period from, from what we would expect. And this haunted Dodds throughout his life. Um, there was a real attitude in this period that if you haven't fought for your country, that you are sort of, you know, unpatriotic and that you are kind of, I guess in some ways, the kind of a, a lesser man than someone like Maurice Bauer, who's kind of proudly gone and sort of defended his country, you know, through trench warfare. Did Bauer come with any kinds of um, handicap or extracurricular? I mean, black marks that might be held again. I'm trying to get at their scholarship is one thing, but as we all probably know, appointments are not often completely rational and based on objective criteria. There's always something uh, other than their actual publications or their ability to teach and let, whatever, whatever. So what, did Bauer come with any kinds of, um, as it were, handicap or, or special personal features that might make him questionable in some people's eyes? Well, Morris Bauer was gay and he, oh. he never came out as gay explicitly he so he spoke of um sort of courting several women he proposed to more than one woman in his lifetime um and the sort of the the full truth of his sort of romantic life isn't known because he, he didn't share it with other people and i think we have to remember that homosexuality in this period is illegal 
um, and he couldn't be as open about his private life as maybe he wanted to be. I mean, certainly I think among cer certain sets in Oxford, it was kind of an open secret. There are certainly students who were aware um, of, of his sexuality, but in terms of sort of the broader university, he, he had to be quiet about it. Um, and there was a sort of a real pressure on him to, to be so. Um, so that kind of, in my feeling, and sort of the sources that I read, I very much got the impression that he was held back because of that. And there is a certain literary connection possibly with uh, a certain character in a certain book, Bride said. Yes, yeah. So this is another thing, another sort of reason why I think it's sort of important to look at the, the sources. If you've, if you've read Brideshead Revisited, uh, you'll come across Mr. Sam Grass, who is the Don who's sent to sort of keep an eye on Sebastian Flight as he becomes increasingly drunk and out of control. And Mr. Sam Grass is a horribly treacly character. He does not come out of the novel well at all. He's very, very obsequious. Um, it's very hard to take to him. And so my view is that sort of I mean, Evelyn Waugh was quite a mischievous character. Um, he uh, was quite sort of, um, he had friends, but he had frenemies. And I think sort of his, his relationship with, with Morris Bower, he only really kind of got to know him well later in life, but he was quite sort of, you know, difficult. And he wanted to present him as being a sort of a, a less popular character than Morris Bower really was. Morris Bower was popular with, with students, but you won't get that impression from reading Bright's Head Revisited and seeing him sort of vocalised through, through Mr. Sam Grass. Uh, so that in itself I found interesting. So one of the set pieces of your book, which is by the way, I think beautifully written as well as um, interestingly uh, conceived, yeah. is precisely the contest, the agone for the chair in 1936. And you've explained the who the characters principally concerned, I believe Murray, in a way, illicitly and unconventionally actually intervened in some way. Um, but that's in a way neither here nor there. How come it came down to Bower versus um, Dodds? And how come the issue was as fraught as it was, do you think? Well, the, the particular professorship, the Swedish professorship, the, so the, the process by which a professor is elected that post, it is, and but it was more so back then, kind of shrouded in secrecy. Um, it was a crown appointment by its nature. It was created, the whole sort of position was created by Henry VIII in 1541. And uh, sort of typically, um, so the, the, the monarch at one stage would, would select someone. Um, so Chris, Professor uh, Christopher Pelling, this is a recent Regis professor. He kindly shared with me when I was researching this book a paper that he'd a talk he'd given on uh, the sort of the history of this position, and it's very amusing. I sort of I quote from it uh, in my book. Uh, uh, he sort of talks about sort of Queen Anne choosing an Anglo-Saxon specialist partly because she admired him because he he was very brave in having a leg amputation. So not necessarily on the strength of of uh, sort of classical scholarship. And over time, it becomes okay. a position which is sort of selected more by the prime minister, who would kind of send his appointment secretary down to the university, take soundings, sort of report back, and then the selected candidate will receive a letters patent and be elected to the seat. Um, and when Gilbert Murray approaches his retirement, he's a bit concerned because he hears that uh, people are trying to put themselves forward for the post. And that's certainly something you do not do for this particular post. Um, right. It may be shrouded in secrecy if you don't sort of elect yourself and say, hey, I quite fancy doing this job. That just is not sort of the way um, it carries on. And I don't want to give away the whole sort of plot twist in the book. You have to read the book for, for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, Gilbert Murray perhaps uh, lends a bit more advice than he ought to to the Prime Minister at this stage, who's Stanley Baldwin, and E.R. Dodds is quite damning about Stanley Baldwin. He, he describes him as being a rather lazy man and sort of not really having much. He's not a classicist. He doesn't seem to have much interest in this particular position. So the, sort of the, the, the group of candidates um, is slightly more uh, swayed by Gilbert Murray's decision than would be sort of in keeping with the traditions of the election process. And 36 was, of course, the abdication crisis as well. So it's a particularly politically charged moment, rather 
fascinating to think of the Regis chair in that context. Mm. So um, now this is, I'm, I'm going to ask you for a personal opinion. It's very difficult, but looking back from our um, standpoint in 2022, at the time, I'm, I know opinions varied, but in the longer run, which of the two, Dodds or Bower, do you think has most contributed to what uh, my society is called the promotion of Hellenic studies? So to the promotion of Hellenic studies. Yeah, it's an interesting and difficult question to answer. Um, when Dodds uh, went back to Oxford, and um, became professor of Greek, there were a lot of questions over what he'd actually done to deserve that honor. Um, he'd sort of specialized in, I think Gilbert Murray described them as, as obscure uh, sort of authors that no one really reads, so Plotinus, and he'd done sort of a commentary on, on Proclus and uh, say it's the first classes and not really people that I'd, certainly I hadn't really studied very much of um, as a student, so they weren't sort of immediately familiar. So it was a bit of a gamble selecting Dodds, but I think he proved himself as a very, very capable and very, very inspiring scholar as time went by. I mean, his work on Plato's Gorgias, on uh, his edition of Euripides Bacchae, and I think above all, his, his book, The Greeks and the Irrational, have really stood the test of time in a way that Morris Bower's scholarship hasn't so much. At the same time, I kind of want to get a, get rid of, I mean, there's, I think Morris Barras had a slightly unfair press. I think the fact that he was such an outspoken character, that he was a socialite, that he kind of befriended all these very grand people has kind of worked against him. And almost people have seen that as being a way of him trying to overcompensate for the fact that he wasn't such a strong scholar. I'd say his strength was more as a kind of a literary critic. He was very well versed in poetry more generally. So he had a good working knowledge of German and Russian, and he was able to draw parallels between contemporary German poetry, contemporary Russian poetry, between T.S. Eliot and ancient Greek poetry, and sort of forge connections between cultures, which in itself was interesting and important when it came to inspiring other people who weren't necessarily from a classical background to become interested in the ancient world. So he sort of fostered, um, he kind of took under his wing rather, uh, sort of Henry Green, the novelist, and Cecil Day Lewis and John Betjeman. And I think, you know, his great contribution really is to sort of, uh, to be inspiring to these other classicists and other, sorry, non-classicists and other students by sort of forging connections across different subject areas. Whereas I think that Dodds's scholarship is the one that's kind of better stood the test of time. And also, I think um, your very concluding uh, sentence of the entire book that Dodds speaks to our mental anguish, our internal anxieties about self and other and things like this mystery. And of course, Dodds was particularly interested in the super or paranormal, which of course many, many people are today because yeah. the real world, as it were, the normal seems pretty ghastly and one wants some kind of either escape from it or some kind of insight into it. So in a way, Dodds has proved to be a far more modern or even contemporary figure than uh, Bauer. Well, now you mentioned earlier, now this is more a question of um, Murray, but it's also related to um, Dodds, because Dodds, when he was at Birmingham, he attracted to himself someone we, I don't think we've mentioned him yet, have we, Louis McNeese? And uh, Whiston Auden, I think you did mention, but I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Dodds was drawn to such modern figures, one of whom was, of course, a classicist, an Oxford classicist, namely McNeese. So translations. Um, you've pointed out that T.S. Eliot was particularly critical of Murray's verse translations of Euripides. Why was that? Was it merely literary jealousy of one literary figure of another? Or were there some substantial, um, either conceptual or um, straightforwardly uh, linguistic issues at stake? I would say it's not jealousy so much as T.S. I mean, he was very, very rude. I have to say about Gilbert Murray's translation. Um, and he, he called Gilbert Murray a very insignificant follower of the pre-Raphaelite movement. And he wrote publicly uh, sort of an essay about his, his translations. And 
He had a point in so far as if you read Gilbert Murray's translations today, although brilliant in many ways, they're very, very florid. And I think Maurice Bower put it best. He said that Gilbert Murray translated consciously in an archaic way and in an idiom in which the sort of the British public at this time were comfortable. So it has sort of elements of Swinburne and the kind of other poets that people were reading. And it has that kind of Victoria on Victoria on a kind of quite flowery, florid uh, nature to it. And this wasn't off-putting for a lot of people. So, I mean, it, uh, suffragettes, for example, were reading aspect, uh, passages from uh, Gilbert Murray's translation from Medea. The BBC would still uh, put on the uh, Gilbert Murray's plays during the wartime stuff because they were thought to resonate with wartime audiences and they remained popular but at the same time T.S. Eliot picked up on the fact that there was something very very old-fashioned and quite distancing about those texts which he felt stopped I think modern readers from being able to connect with them in the same way and he wanted to remedy that uh, so when he became an editor at Faber and Faber, he took on Louis McNeese, who, as you say, E.R. Dodds befriended, um, he befriended him at Birmingham. And uh, Louis McNeese translated uh, Aeschylus' Agamemnon. And he did that, you know, very well. I, a few years ago, I put together an anthology of stories called Of Gods and Men. And I was choosing sort of uh, the, passages of, of stories from, from different classical texts in English translation. And I chose Louis McNeese's translation because I found it interesting. And I think it is a very clear translation by comparison with Gilbert Murray's. But at the same time, I think there are aspects where there are certain passages I, I find almost too plain. You know, I feel like almost Gilbert Murray had something over, over it in, in, in certain, certain bits. So I kind of think that, I mean, Eliot was, you know, very, very mocking of all the kind of ear to thus and hither and thither. And, you know, we probably don't hate that so much today, but um, at the same time, you know, I think it's a question of balance. So it is partly stylistic, um, partly a matter of form as opposed to content. I suppose I would say that in the post Second War period, the at least the most uh, stimulating, the most original equivalent of Murray, that is a classicist who tries to use his creative work to advance um, the literary field based on a classical core is uh, Tony Harrison. I don't know whether he's somebody that um, you would want to compare and contrast particularly with um, Murray or do you see them as in completely different sorts of categories? I think I think they, they are quite different um, the same way I, I kind of there's a there's a recent book on Tony Harrison it's Edith Hall's book that she did with him and yes. I think you, know, you can almost see I, I can see where, where, where you're coming from with that parallel and I think yeah. I mean what this really says to me is just how how clearly these Greek plays have resounded over time I think the fact that this is part of their strength that they can find sort of a new voice in so many different different styles one that while still being the same play and still carrying the same sort of feeling and ev evoking the same emotion regardless of the kind of style in which they're they're written in so I think that's why uh, Gilbert Murray's plays and his translations I mean I think they should still be read um, if not sort of as your kind of first if you're giving it to a young person for example I wouldn't give Gilbert Murray's translation of Medea to, to a young person reading Medea for the first time, you know, I've choose a sort of a, a more um, accessible translation, but I still think they're kind of, they're very interesting to read um, on their own merit. Thanks very much. Then the, if you like, the elephant in the room, which we've not specifically addressed, the interwar years in Europe are the years of the rise of fascism and uh, Nazism. Could you say just a little about how classics was situated, both from the point of view of the dictators and from the point of view of the anti-dictators in these years? Yeah, so this is another um, reason why classics kind of comes to the sort of forefront of the national conversation or international conversation, really, because suddenly it finds itself um, being contorted often. Um, it's kind of another exercise in sort of classical reception we were talking about earlier. People are picking up works like um, Plato's Republic and sort of aspects of, of kind of classical statuary and sort of reading new meanings into it, which is actually quite dangerous for the subject itself. And for example, I mean, Hitler had a, a real interest in Spartan history. For example, so he he wrote something called the Zweitesbuch, a secret book, um, 
in sort of 1928, um, and it was sort of only published posthumously. And then he's sort of praising, you know, ancient Spartan practice of, of exposing uh, sort of unwell children, uh, for example, without yeah. any real context or sort of understanding of that. And I think, I mean, Paul, you can speak to this um, um, very well, I'm, I'm sure about sort of, you know, there is some confusion in the sources now about sort of the nature of the, the, the process of sort of exposing children in Spartan culture, which isn't necessarily understood uh, well. And he's kind of, you know, he's interested in sort of building up a, a sort of very powerful military state. And sort of as time goes on, we find sort of in German school children being sort of forced to read passages of Tacitus, which describe the kind of the mightiness of, of the sort of Germanic tribes and, you know, the hardiness to uh, temperatures and sort of extreme coldness and heat and thirst and things like that. And then, I mean, Spartan culture just kind of takes over um, sort of Nazi Germany, gets sort of Spartan brandy on cosmetics. And Hitler sort of famously bought a copy of Myron's discus thrower uh, sort of another sort of example, sort of a admiration for, for, for sort of bodily strength. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's contorted in a way which is incredibly troubling. And uh, one of the scholars at the time talks about there being sort of a, a real distaste for Plato sort of developing in the West as a result of, of, of the way that Plato's texts were mined and sort of taken out of context. So I think classicists really have a sort of battle on their hands to try and reclaim the subject away from uh, the way it's been sort of pulled apart and sort of the way that history is really being trampled on and contorted out of any kind of recognition. Um, Dodds himself said something like, um, with Plato, you only sort of have to arm yourself with a stout pair of blinkers, and then you can prove that Plato is, you can make him almost anything you want him to be. And that's something I think which sort of was important for people to remember in that period. Thank you. Very, that's really, really interesting. Uh, I had just one um, little uh, detail to add. Um, it's about RHS. That's Dick Crossman. He was a Don, a classics Don at New College, which was my own college. And later, of course, he became a minister in the Labour government of 1964 and following and wrote his diaries, the Crossman diaries. But in 37, he wrote a book called Plato Today. And that was, um, it's not unique but there was quite a widespread view that if you read Plato in a certain way as you say you could make him what you want almost one of the things you could make him was a kind of fascist or proto-Nazi so um, the stakes were quite high I mean classics was not some comfortable subject that you could um, simply bury your head in the sand and study well I've said enough I'm just going to ask you is there a question I've not asked you something that you would like now to say before I'm then going to have a look at the chat box and see whether there's anything in there that any of our audience has come up with but is there some dimension of your work that we've not had time yet to address? I think we've covered it quite well I mean I, I would say sort of what's um, interesting sort of in, in the period I'm writing about in particular is sort of the, the way that sort of opportunities develop for, for women in this period. I think Gilbert Murray is doing a lot to try and champion uh, you know, young women and sort of foster an interest in classics uh, within them. And you sort of find uh, people like Mary Renault sort of attending his lectures, which I think is, is interesting. And um, I think sort of more broadly, uh, there's sort of the interest in classics and sort of the fact that people were, I think, immediately familiar uh, with a lot of it if you read uh, a book like uh, Zuleika Dobson, you know, there's, there's some references to Momsen, as if so, like any reader is going to know who Momsen is. You know, it's things are written on a slightly, slightly different plane and with different assumptions. To you know, if we're writing a book today, um, so I think the nature of the subject has changed, and so the familiarity with it and assumptions made, um, you know, things have shifted around, and you know, in some ways for for the better, and it's really. I think pleasing for me that more people are, you know, able to read classics and a lot more of these texts which are translated in English. And so everything's become a lot more accessible. And I think that's, you know, a really good thing. And in my book, what I'm trying to do is to pinpoint uh, the time where this is starting to happen, you know, where things are starting to open up, opportunities are beginning to, to um, be found by, you know, writers who aren't necessarily those who've, you know, been studying Greek since the age of six, things are starting to change.
I'm very glad you mentioned Mary Renault. Um, she's my probably my favorite historical novelist of all time. And The Last of the Wine, uh, 1956, mm -hmm. is probably my favorite historical novel of hers. But mm -hmm. uh, I also take the hit, uh, Daisy, that we in Cambridge were incredibly backward in uh, <laughs> making uh, women equal uh, in terms of getting degree. But I would add that in Oxford, in your period, there was actually a quota, wasn't there? I mean, a numerical upper limit on how many females it was tolerable for the men to have to put up with yeah. as their fellow undergrad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've moved on. We've moved on, and that's such a good thing. I mean, this is something I think you'll probably pick up on if you read my book. I mean, there's a lot of sort of, you know, get so cross thinking, yes, 1920s, so 1920 women get degrees, 1927, a, a cap is put on the number of women allowed to study there and come up. And so I think this is why I found this an important book to write. I need to sort of shed light on things, even if they're negative things, because we need to understand where we've come from, you know, even if they're good things, if they're bad things, and sort of, you know, to understand the, the past and the history of our subject, as well as the present and the future of it. So now draw a deep breath because I have looked in the chat box and I found the very long but very articulate question from one of our viewers and uh, he is called Howard Anglin and this is the question. The story of Brideshead, even in the chapters set at the university, show a world in which students and some dons moved between Oxford and London and the country, with the circles of each world overlapping. So the question is, how much was Oxford part of the wider world between the wars, and how much was it still a world of its own, bound by its own rhythms and rituals? And then a supplementary, how and how successfully did the Oxford figures you write about navigate between the cosmopolitan and the parochial, between the social world and world of scholarship. So it's about three questions uh, wow. in one. And so take your time. And yeah, if you are written. not clear exactly, I'll come back to it if you need me to rehearse okay. the question again. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I could almost write a sort of a, an essay on, on, on that, I think, in itself. I and mean, I think, um, something I say in the book and something certainly present in my time we used to talk about being in the Oxford bubble and as a kind of a feeling that when you're in Oxford you're quite cut off from the world around you but in this period that is, that bubble is burst um, by the fact by the world events outside so things such as the general strike um, you know doesn't really have much relation to Oxford in terms of a place but then it, it affects Oxford and you find Cecil Day Lewis and students for the first time you know, really engaging with um, the working class and sort of miners and sort of the, the north of England and not, you know, they haven't really thought about this and some that kind of break the strike as a bit of a joke. At the same time, there's a sort of a, a feeling among some of them, at least, that something important is happening. And uh, there's the, the student newspaper, Charwell, and there's an editorial describing this as being, you know, a really important turning point in the 1920s. So external events begin to sort of impinge upon Oxford. Uh, this happens again in the run up to, to war. There's a kind of um, deputation of Nazis who arrive in Oxford and Dodds has to meet with them. And so there's a feeling that you can't remain kind of cut off in Oxford. And this is part of the story I'm trying to tell that you're, you know, Oxford is a lovely kind of uh, bubble of an Arcadia in some ways. At the same time, you, it's impossible in this period to remain um, in isolation from it. And certainly um, today, I think with the Oxford Union, we talked about the um, the, the King Country debate, that's something again, Wilkes is kind of propelled into the international press. And the figures such as Morris Bauer, I think in particular, he is navigating uh, the world of Oxford, but he's also kind of stepping outside as well. He's kind of rubbing shoulders with royalty and he sort of spends his weekends at Garstington Manor, 
you know, befriending Virginia Woolf and people like that. So the real kind of marriage between the social world and the world of scholarship represented within the figure of Maris ba Morris Bower, who's incredibly entertaining. And, you know, he, he writes um, really quite wicked things by, about a lot of these people. He calls Virginia Woolf a bore because she fails to take much interest in him, at least in, in my opinion. So you get sort of a really interesting insight on the, sort of the social world uh, outside of Oxford through these, these Oxford figures. Quite, I think, worth uh, adding that both of them wrote memoirs, first um, Barra and then Dodds, and so Dodds was able to comment on Barra's. I've got a kind of supplementary to the question that was uh, first put to you, which is about, in particular, the British Empire, or what became the Commonwealth, of course. Um, did that impact at all, or was it um, simply that Murray happened to be an Australian, or, or was that aspect of British history at all um, relevant or perceived to be relevant within the classical world, and in particular the classical world of your three protagonists? I think by virtue of his position, so Gilbert Murray um, was involved in the, sort of the initial paperwork of the League of Nations Union, which was, um, he actually served as the chairman of this body. And it was a kind of body to try and promote public interest and support for maintaining a league for peace after the First World War. And he was going to Geneva, you know, for these sort of conventions with sort of political figures. And I think because he is Regis Professor of Greek and he has this other hat on as well, um, there's a kind of link that's forged um, between them, and he's certainly still really engaged in things like the Abyssinian crisis. And, um, you know, because people in Oxford know that he's going to these meetings and he's hearing things sort of from, from Parliament and from Westminster, they're all kind of bending his ear and wanting to find out. And he kind of lands himself in trouble for, for talking about things that he, he shouldn't be talking about in Oxford. So that helps to create a connection. Um, sort of with, with the wider world, um, so sort of through with really the League of Nations work. And then, you know, a lot of the students are interested, not just because Gilbert Murray's involved, but they're joining the League of Nations Union themselves. There's kind of a, a, quite a strong membership among them. So uh, I think that would be my, my answer. Thank you very much. Now you've got, as you, I hope, know, many, many fans and several of them in the question and the chat boxes have demanded to know, what is your next book? They're, they're waiting for your next one. Um, my, my next book uh, I is a, a brand new history of the ancient world told uh, predominantly through the women. So it's a big, oh. big book um, called uh, Pandora's Revenge. So <laughs> it's in the fight with my Oh, well, that's excellent. I think that will make a uh, very interesting reading for many people. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to now conclude this segment of our event and thank you for answering the question so fully and clearly. And uh, we're now going to move on to a segment about the educational side of our Classics for All charity. And so I'm going to hand over now, thank you, Daisy, to Hilary, Hilary Hodgson. Hello. Hi. Um, and I've got with me tonight, thank you very much, Paul Cartledge and, um, and Daisy. That was really inspiring. Um, as Daisy says, um, you know, the whole impetus and mission of Classics for All is to foster interest in classics in state schools. And since we were founded 11 years ago, we've actually put classics or supported the development of classics in over 1,200 schools, many of them in quite disadvantaged neighbourhoods. Um, and that's required quite a lot of focus on imaginative ways of making people feel comfortable with classics. And I've got with me tonight um, Joan Foley, um, who was the former head of the Postgraduate uh, Certificate in Education course at the University of West England, where she led the Secondary English course. Um, and I've brought her along just to demonstrate that although we work largely just with teachers in schools we also work in teacher training um, and Joan is a teacher trainer and her own story is fascinating and reinforces quite a lot of the points I think we have about classical reception tonight and popularizing and fostering a broader interest in classics for young people whatever their background is so I'm just starting with you Joan and your own background um, what what 
when did you first kind of encounter classics yourself? Is it something you were brought up with? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I didn't know there was such a thing called classics, didn't know it existed. Um, went to a, a, a fabulous state school, actually, in the Midlands. Um, and we were some of the, the first few um, students to think about uh, going to university. Um, I, I look, I know I only looked 27, but this was years and years ago. Um, so we're talking about 1979, uh, when I was applying for university, and it became clear to me that to do an English degree, which is what I wanted to do, um, meant that I needed to have Latin um, as an O-level. Um, mm. And I didn't have Latin as an O-level, and nor did my best friend who was also going to go to university to read English too. Um, and so our state school got in contact with uh, the grammar school um, and asked, could somebody help us? Um, and we had a visit by a teacher um, who came along with some books, um, but sadly, um, didn't come back. So there was a, a rather frightening bit of a fight going on outside the classroom that we were in. And she decided that she wasn't going to come back to help us. And that was my first feeling that perhaps this wasn't for the likes of us, not for the mm. likes of us. Um, luckily, went to university. I did read English, but I, I will point out that on the reading list um, that I received before um, I started my course, there were some books that I'd never heard of. One of them was the Iliad and the other was the Odyssey. And mm -hmm. so there was a sense that you needed to have this kind of background before you could move on um, and study. Um, fast forward, fast forward to my being an English teacher in, in the state system um, and the, the new national curriculum that came in in the 90s and there enshrined in the English national curriculum was a demand that in the English classroom we, we should be teaching Greek myths um, and legends. Um, and I was terrified because I didn't know very many Greek myths and legends. And whenever I saw a reference to um, a classical story when I was reading Hamlet or whatever, I could spend a lot of time trying to find out what on earth was being referred to. Mm. So, so for me, no, classics was not in my background. And I really wish that Classics for All had been around when I was at school in a state school. Um, I would have welcomed the help that you now provide. Um, well, it's it's kind of weird because I went to I was in the last year of a grammar school cohort in Shropshire, where I was probably the last pupil that had access to Latin, which I also needed to get into university to do. In, in fact, I did modern languages. So, you know, it, it was even then quite a, a rarity. Um, but fast forwarding on to your your tenure at UEE and the work you did with the PGCDL, you actually introduced classics as part of the English teacher training at uh, the University of West England. What, what inspired you to do that, given that it had been a fairly terrifying prospect? What, what was the kind of launch point for that? Um, I think it was Bob Lister, actually. It was right. Bob Lister for, um, who was offering uh, free sessions to PGCE courses, to English courses, which would um, introduce myths and legends and ways of working with story in the English classroom um, using these foundational stories, using these foundational mm. texts. Um, talk to anybody who is running a PGCE course um, in the country and you'll find out that they'll take, uh, be very interested in any free uh, CPD that's available to them and so without knowing Bob and without knowing what he was going to do I invited him to come and work with my trainees this was in uh, 2011 and the session that we had was one of the most inspiring bits of teaching I think I've seen for a long time so with his his depth of knowledge and with his absolute joy in story he shared um myths and legends using the storytelling of, of um, Hugh Lupton and Daniel Morden to yeah. really get those trainee teachers excited about, um, about myths and legends. And mm -hmm. in two hours, we could see that there was an awful lot that we could take from that work into a key stage three English classroom. And, um, and it was from that point that Bob came every year to work with my, with my trainee teachers. And in turn, we took those stories into our local schools, many of those schools um, in areas of deprivation. Mm 
Yeah, and and what what was the impact on the trainees, and 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 d d has that had, do you think, an impact on the way that English teachers convey, you know, reference points for for English and Shakespeare and the rest of it? I mean, how is it how is it kind of driven forward the teaching of English? So lots of the trainees, when they start their teacher training, um, always talk about the fact that they feel that they don't have enough subject knowledge. Yes, they've got their degrees in their subject area, but when they actually encounter what the English curriculum is in school, it's a very different beast from the kind of English degree courses that they've been studying at university. Mm -hmm. And so what they want is to enrich that subject knowledge and to have confidence in what they're offering their students. Um, and it was absolutely the case that having taken part in some of those workshops um, with Bob, they could see that their own discussion of, of English literary text could be greater informed by knowing about those myths and legends and, and being able to weave those stories, being able very readily and very quickly to share those stories with their students in the classroom as just part of their repertoire of their story hoard, if you like. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it was the rich that that actually provided them in their teaching of poetry and their teaching of Shakespeare and their teaching of, of modern fiction that they they could see was really important and equally they could see that these stories had something to say to teenagers so stories that have got um, moral challenges have got debate um, that don't have neat answers that talk about changing you know metamorphosis that the changes that take place in 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 teenagers themselves are echoed aren't they in some of those mm. myths and legends um that we were able to share with those with those children yeah so that breadth of cultural reference points the the, the kind of moral framework the the questioning i mean how has it developed i mean we've started i think this has been quite pioneering for us because we've now started to integrate this kind of work in a number of teacher training courses across the country. But what do you think is the scope for developing this further, given that we don't train that many uh, classic specialist teachers uh, per year? What, what's the future of this? Well, I, I think it's really important that what we offer um, our new teachers and our, our children in school is the gift that is story. And it's the gift of stories that have something to say to us all. Um, and I really feel that if we can encourage people to think that these stories are for them and they're not things to be frightened of, it, it, is, it, it is what they can draw on, is what they can say is theirs, that they can take those stories to their hearts. I think those things are really, really important. And if we, if we take that into the English classroom, who knows, there might be a child in your English classroom for whom that spark of interest might make them want to, mm. to follow the classics thread. Yeah, um, I think so we've, got quite, we've got quite a lot of evidence that that's the case actually, because we're starting to integrate quite a lot of classical subjects into the key stage three curriculum, into English, into history, into modern languages. And we're finding a steady stream of schools now coming to us and saying that all pupils, a lot of pupils, are interested and want to do classical civilization, GCSE, or even Latin in some cases. So there's definitely a trend towards that. So all is not lost. I think time wise, I'm going to have to stop us there. Um, but I hope that's been a fascinating insight into some of the things we do. And for anybody in the audience who knows of schools or is a teacher um, and is uh, questioning whether they ought to introduce classics. We do everything we do for free. All of the training we offer is for free. And it's down to some of the people in the audience tonight that we're able to do what we do. So thank you very much, Joan. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary. That was a superb interview with uh, Joan. Um, Joan, thank you. Inspirational. And just to say before I wrap up that uh, if you look in the chat box, there are a number of contributions which have a wider relevance and significance. So thanks to Fiona, to Emma, to Alexandra and so on. Really good of you to take such an interest. And I see there are still over 60 people uh, online and we started off with well over 100. So I'm really pleased this is at least on the surface been an extremely successful event. Thank you again to Classics for All and in particular Thank you, dear Daisy.
one of my dearest friends. It's been such a pleasure and um, we look forward to seeing you all, that is all of you, um, not just us panellists, but uh, people who tuned in to listen for the last hour or so. Thank you all so much. Thank Goodbye you. for now. Thank you.